Uh, I'm a little late in getting started, which is kind of par for the course in getting here this year. Um, as soon as I crossed from Missouri into Illinois, it became so foggy you could cut it with a knife. And I drove up I-55 about 30 miles before I realized I was no longer on I-70 because you couldn't see anything around you. So I wound up taking a detour through Springfield, Illinois and, and across, but it was okay. Just as I got into Springfield here on the north side of town, uh, my because I had left the GPS on my phone since I had lost my way, and the Android decided to kick on the personal assistant for no apparent reason. And I'm, I'm just entering town and it says, hello, Jeffrey, I'm your personal assistant. How can I help you? And I was really surprised. I, I let an expletive slip and I said, what the? And not thinking anything of it. And a few seconds later, the personal assistant responds, I don't know. <laughs> and it actually kept, I, and then after I got stopped, I looked and it actually keeps a transcript of that conversation. <laughs> So you can see what the, and then I don't know. It's just like, all right, that's, that's technology for you. Okay, um, this is me. I have a small YouTube channel, which I started because it pains me to see people struggling to work on their vintage computers, and I wanted to pass on things I've learned over the years. So I always start out my videos saying, hi, I'm Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, uh, because I didn't know what else to say at the time. Uh, I've lived in Missouri my entire adult, adult life, but I grew up about uh, 20 miles up the road. I bought my first Tandy computer, a Pocket Computer 6, here in Springfield. Um, I, I didn't exactly know where to start this talk, which is about physical and cosmetic restoration. So I figured the best thing to do is go in the order which you would normally do these things when you're working on your equipment. So that is cleaning it because stuff's usually nor you know pretty filthy. Uh, doing physical repairs and any refinishing you might choose to do. So that's the order we'll go through this. And uh, since we're going to start with cleaning, I want to start with very basic. And this may seem overly pedantic, but I've seen a lot of interesting things that people do online trying to clean their vintage equipment. Um, so I just thought I would pose these questions, you know, what do you do? What do you use when you want to do these normal everyday cleaning tasks? <coughs> and of course, you would use soap. The type of soap varies. You don't use dish soap to wash your car. You know, you don't use dish soap for your clothes and things <coughs> like that. But you start with some type of soap, a mild cleanser. Um, You know, and you generally want to go in strength from mild to wild. Uh, dish soap, Formula 409 is kind of the, the area where I start. Uh, that's fine for most things. Alcohol can be very useful. It's not a great thing at getting dirt off in general, and it can be damaging to some surfaces, uh, even some types of plastic, so be very careful there. The cleaning supplies are super simple. This, I'm cleaning up a Model 4 case, which is kind of relatively big, so I've got a bucket outside. There are some pretty good scratches on the keyboard and some on the case, so I use some of that Orange Mechanics hand cleaner and a, a scrub brush to get those. There's also a uh, thing called a, a Magic Eraser, which is a melamine sponge. It can be very handy for getting black scuff marks off of cases and cords and things like that. All of this stuff, even your cleaning rags, are slightly abrasive. So if you really go crazy, you can change the luster of the plastic a little bit. I've had some spots that were really tough to clean off. And it, it changed the luster of the plastic. And then I was able to use some plastic polish to kind of blend that in and bring everything back to where it matched. And you couldn't tell I was there. For smaller objects like keycaps or keycaps for pocket computers or calculators, uh, smaller buckets, things like that. I like soaking them for an hour or so in soapy water because uh, that normally does most of the work for you and I've always got a lot of other jobs to do work, you know, in restoring something. So soak them in soapy water, scrub them with a the toothbrush, put them in another bucket and rinse with clean water and let them dry thoroughly. If I'm in a hurry, I'll 
take the larger keycaps out to the garage and blow them with a low pressure compressed air, especially getting the water out of the bottom. That'll help a lot. Uh, your circuit boards, you can actually wash circuit boards. Now, in the factory, uh, a lot of times they'll use a water clean flux and they have things which are look like dishwashers and some small factories will actually use a dishwasher and they have nice clean water and they'll actually wash the boards. You don't want to put this in your household dishwasher and use your household dishwasher soap on the board. Uh, I live in Missouri which is built on top of limestone so all your water builds up limestone crud on everything. So here I'm using distilled water and uh, some mild cleanser and a brush to clean this board. I don't even remember looking at that, what it's off of. No idea off the top of my head what that's off of. But anyhow, it was rather dirty. So this was, oh, that's off of VIC-20. Yes, okay. Um, yes, this was a very dirty machine. So you can do that thoroughly, uh, dry it before you try to power it up. I mean, at least overnight, you can use uh, compressed air to dry it a little faster. You can rinse it with alcohol the alcohol will absorb the water and then dry a little faster. I don't recall on that one. It was probably just dish soap or 409. Uh, when you're washing circuit boards, the thing you want to watch out for is if it has relays or other things that will leak water into them. Then if you need to wash the board, you need to pull uh, the relays off of there. If you have an ultrasonic cleaner and you want to use that to clean your board, Again, watch out for relays, watch out for 32 kilohertz uh, crystals that are used in real-time clock circuits. That is really close to the 40 kilohertz that the ultrasonic cleaners use, and they can damage those crystals. So you have to remove those delicate parts before you try to ultrasonic clean it. Sticky residue. Uh, you gotta be careful here because a lot of the things that'll take the sticky goo off well and do a good job and do it quickly, might also attack various peanut surfaces and things. Um, WD-40, Goo Gone, these things are kind of petroleum base. They generally do a pretty good job. Uh, WD-40 seems to be my go-to because it's generally safe around most things. Um, alcohols work good. I have, the, I brought the cassette deck with me I nearly messed up the battery cover because I was trying to get the foam off of the inside to replace it. And I soaked it in alcohol and it leaked around to the backside and attacked the silver paint. So TRS-80 silver paint and alcohol is not a good combination. Got to be very careful there. Cords also seem to always get grungy. Um, and like they say in all the, you know, the product packaging, test in a hidden area, because you don't know what it's going to do. Everything's a little different. Even if it's powder coated or everything, it can be slightly different. The, the vintage computer community seems to be really in love with isopropyl alcohol and want to use it on everything. Uh, I just want to stress again, it can damage things, uh, especially clear plastics, translucent plastics. It can actually craze or crack those. You gotta be very careful and you don't know what type of plastic it is 99.9% .9 of the time. So use it very sparingly in those cases. Some types of rubber, it's usually soft rubber used for feed rollers, typewriter platens, uh, flat matrix printer platens. Those can be affected by alcohol and it'll actually harden the rubber. You'll improve it temporarily and then you'll destroy the rubber. Um, so I usually just use soap and water on those. You know, most types of rubber you run into, alcohol is not a problem. It's just those few and you never know. Uh, a couple of cases where I've used the goo removal. This is that rubber strip that's on the bottom of the Model 4P keyboard that is hiding some screws and is cracked anyhow. So you can scrape that off there with the plastic uh, implement. Then I used some WD-40 to, to clean that off there. That worked great. WD-40 takes a little while, but that's okay. This I also brought with me. I called it the Pigpen PC-1 because it literally looked like somebody was using this in a pig pen. I later found some bedding slips in the, the sexy velour case that it came in. And uh, a friend of mine said, no, I, I, I don't think that's horse racing or anything. I think those are from uh, dog racing in Florida. But there was copious amounts of tape all over this thing or it was broken and there was things falling off and just goo everywhere. And that, that picture with the key, little keys in the cup was from the computer. It was just so filthy. It was amazing, but it, it cleaned up really good. 
And probably the worst type of corrosion I'll get into is, or the worst type of cleaning job you'll get into is cleaning from corrosion, from leaking batteries, leaking capacitors. Um, these things that are leaking inside our machines causing all the damage, they can have a, an alkaline base or an acidic base. So if you're trying to neutralize that after you do most of the cleaning, you need to have an idea of what it was uh, so you can neutralize it. The first step in this job, whether it's batteries or capacitors that have leaked, is some mechanical abrasion. You've got to get the crud off of there and go on or it'll continue to corrode. Um, Use a scraper, a wire brush, a fiberglass pin, something like that, you know, after you move the part to get off of there. The capacitors can be kind of a pain because that uh, electrolyte from the capacitor will actually change the tin lid and it, it'll form an oxide on the outside surface of the solder joint with a much higher melting temperature. And so if you, if you get that hot enough to desolder, you'll completely ruin the joint and delaminate the, the pad. So you've got to mechanically scrape that joint to get that surface off of there so you can desolder it. These little fiberglass pins, you can get them on Amazon in lots of places. I was introduced to these by another YouTuber called Gadget UK. These are the greatest things since sliced bread for corrosion from, you know, on circuit board traces and things like that. And you can get refills. <coughs> Uh, for them, there seem to be two different types. One has a more aggressive abrasive than the other. Uh, the last set I bought, which I liked a little better, were actually made in Germany. They're sturdier, a little more aggressive uh, abrasive. Things like little wire wheels on your Dremel tool can be very handy for certain things. Now, a lot of what I use is a small flat blade screwdriver. I just always run my finger over the end of the screwdriver to make sure there's not a burr on it. And then it makes a perfectly fine little scraper. For neutralizing whatever's caused the corrosion, you need to know what it was. Most of the time, if it's batteries, they were alkaline batteries, unless you have something with an old lead acid battery in it. So for something which, uh, corrosion from an, an alkaline source, you need something acidic to neutralize it. Vinegar works good for that. I like citric acid. This pound of it, it was about eight or nine dollars on Amazon. You mix that with, I don't know, one and a quarter liters, you know, one and a quarter quarts of, of warm water and you'll have about a 40% solution of citric acid. It's food safe and you know I wouldn't drink it in that concentration. Your stomach's not going to thank you for that. But it's, it's food safe. It's, it's not poisonous, right? And it'll last forever. And then I'll dilute it down, down from there. And it doesn't smell like vinegar. Other, you know, and it works a little faster. Other than that, you know, white vinegar or something's fine. For something with an acidic base like the capacitors, lead acid battery, things like that, you can get concentrated cleaners like this, and you know, most soaps like this have an, uh, a, a caustic base. They're slightly alkaline. So this is something I bought for like degreasing car engines and stuff like that. And it's fairly alkaline, and it'll do a good job in those cases. OK, this is, if you like portal battery powered equipment, this is your worst nightmare that somebody's left batteries in something for 20 years. Um, so, you know, this is a case, yeah, they're alkaline batteries, so we're going to use a mild acid to clean it up there. If it's not too bad, sometimes you can just clean it and then wipe over the contacts with some WD-40 and they'll be fine. Uh, in this case, this is from a PC2 or a Sharp PC1500, and the battery compartment is like a two-piece thing that's glued together. You can take the back off the machine, but you can't take that apart without destroying it. Uh, and there's other cases where you can't get the thing, the battery's contacts out of the device really easily. If you mix about 10% glycerin in with your acid, it'll thicken it just enough that you can brush it on the contacts and it'll stay in place and do its job, leave it on there for 10 or 15 minutes or whatever, clean it off, flush it with some alcohol, and you're fine. Uh, the good thing is now if you look on AliExpress and things like that, you can find bags of these contacts that you can get very inexpensively to replace the ones that were too far gone. Uh, I found I bought a couple bags probably four or five years ago, and I still got 90% of them around. But when you need to replace one, it's there. Uh, this is out of a uh, 
PC2 printer cassette interface, the NICAD battery had a really, really sad life and cried everywhere. And it really ate up this plate that was in the bottom. Uh, here where it looks kind of wet, I mechanically abraded what I could. And then I mixed some glycerin with the citric acid and brushed on this. And I did that so I didn't have to have used enough acid in order to soak it in a bath. And that worked fine in this case. If it's not too bad, sometimes you can just wipe that down with something that'll stop it from rusting. In this case, I repainted this plate. The rest of the printer didn't cooperate, but the plate sure looks good. <laughs> this is the case off of the same interface. The battery leakage, the vapors coming off of it was so severe, it caused this white crust. Uh, little citric acid and uh, magic eraser clean that up fairly well. It's still not new looking, but it's a lot better. Uh, it would have been great, but it, the printer was not long for the world. Severe cases of corrosion, you'll get this type of stuff even inside ribbon cables. In this case, this plastic is clear and you can see it. If you can't see that and you've had bad corrosion inside your machine, you can guess that it's like that. This, this cable is completely toast. You have to replace it. Um, even your leads from your battery packs, you can't just snip it off the battery pack. If there's a lot of corrosion, that can leach you know, 100 millimeters or more down the, the lead. If it's a really long lead, sometimes you can cut so much off of it and you know, solder onto it so you're not using as much wire. Most of the time, if there's any corrosion at all, I'll just replace the entire battery lead when I build a new battery pack for it. Because you can't solder to that corrosion that's in the wire. You can't clean it well enough to create a good joint. This, I actually brought this with me. It took me almost a year to fix this silly thing. It was such a pain. Uh, corrosion can hide in some pretty unusual places. This is a PC2 or a Sharp PC1500. Some of them came with this moldy block of goo option. And you never know until you open it up if it's in there. The only thing I can figure is they were trying to create some type of vibration pad between this edge of the board here and, and this metal plate. This is where the LCD is, right? So they, whatever this, it's like some type of waxy stuff with some filler in it that molds over the years and you wind up with this stuff. So like I said, you don't know if it's in there or not. So you have to take it apart and luckily the plate's easy to, to remove. There's three little screws from the top. So you can take it out and scrape that crap off of there and soak it in some you know, acid or something just for a little bit and wipe it down with something to prevent it from rusting again and, and you're good to go. But if anybody knows what material this moldy block of goo was when it started life, I would sure be interested. Uh, I've talked to several people, well, several, two, uh, today so far about leaking capacitors in Model 100s, which is what this is. At the age when they made the Model 100, the, the sub-miniature electrolytic capacitors weren't that great. By the time they got to the 102, they were fine, right? Every Model 100 has leaking capacitors inside, every one of them. By the time, you know, the 102, I've never seen one that's bad. So something changed in there. They, they figured it out. You'll see in this picture, this doesn't look too bad, right? It looks slightly green here. And you know, a lot of people say, well, it doesn't look that bad, right? I don't, you know, whatever. But you scrape all that, that junk off of there and you wind up with this. There's a broken trace. And sometimes the trace won't be a nice big break right out here in the open. It'll be right at the edge of a small pad and you can't see it except under magnification. And it's maddening because maybe sometimes it'll make connection and then it won't and then it will and you're trying to troubleshoot it and it'll never break when you have s some probe on it to look at it. So uh, back to the first step of mitigating this type of damage is to scrape all the crud off there, get down to the base material to see what there is to see. Um, this one's not too bad for Model 100. Some of them are far worse. Uh, and some of them, there's hardly any damage at all. Uh, this is an interesting subject. Uh, I bought uh, a new old stock Amiga 500, which had some silicone grease 
put on some of the keyboard hingy points and it sat in a warehouse somewhere for 30 years which was warm and that grease liquefied and got on many of the conductive rubber bits of the key switches. This thing had never been used but you know like 10 of the keys were completely useless. They've been cont externally contaminated with oil. So I wonder what you could do about it because you can't just wipe it, the oil off of that conductive silicon rubber. It doesn't work. Um, so we find this type of rubber in key contacts, lots of different keyboards use a conductive rubber bit, zebra strips for LCDs, and some accessories on pocket computers use zebra strip contacts. Uh, the rubber can oxidize. You see this a lot on uh, older computer keyboards that use conductive rubber pads. They can be contaminated externally with grease or oil. can actually be contaminated by its own self from leaching silicon oil from in the inside, which sounds impossible. This is a keypad remote that has leached so much silicon oil it looks like it's sweating. And I actually found a, a paper, I don't remember if it was Japanese or Chinese, where they were talking about this and the variables in the manufacturing process that can lead to it. Um, and here's a couple uh, Mitsumi key switches, a lot of computer manufacturers use these types of key switches. Um, so these are the, the type I was having problems with. Uh, and I was still wondering, you know, what can be done about this? How do you clean these? Because, you know, the general advice was, well, you can like maybe sometimes sand them down a little bit and it'll work. So uh, in my experimentation, I actually made this little fixture here so I could test these two key switches with a constant pressure because if you're trying to put your meter probes down on one of those conductive rubber contacts, it flexes and the amount of resistance varies by the amount of pressure and you can't get uh, consistent repeatable results so you know that you're actually accomplishing anything. So this is just a gold coated circuit board with some contacts on it for two different types of key switches. So I can push the key switch down in there and measure the actual resistance. And I found uh, Key switches, if it was usually, at, depending on the machine, usually less than 1K of resistance, the machine was happy with it. Over that, it varied. I found contacts that I had and that people sent me that were close to a, a mega. It varied wildly. Uh, here's another use for zebra ships besides LEDs is in add-on modules for pocket computers. A lot of them used zebra strips. Uh, they're harder if you're trying to test them. They're harder to test the conductivity. The only way I found to do it was to take a couple scrap pieces of uh, PCB stock, sandwich the zebra strip in the middle, use a constant pressure, and then you know how much contact area you have on the zebra strip and what the resistance is. And you can, you know, calculate the resistance per you know, square unit area and you know the thickness of the zebra strip. So. Um, Anyhow, I just wanted to know how to do it. That's how you do it. It works out fairly well with simple tools. Uh, when you're trying to reassemble LCDs, these larger ones like on the Model 100 are a pain to know if you got it aligned right. I 3D printed these little clamps so you can temporarily hold it together, check for alignment. And um, I think I put these up on, on GitHub. And I think I completely skipped a slide which talked about how you do the cleaning. Didn't I? Okay. All right. So let's back up. How do you do the cleaning? Well, it turns out there are industrial chemicals for this, which you can get in 55-gallon drums, which, you know, we, we can't get as hobbyists. And the only thing I read that seemed like it was within the realm of what we could do mentioned that a slightly caustic, a slightly alkaline solution might clean the conductive rubber. So I tried various household chemicals, uh, ammonia, uh, the concentrated cleaner I showed before, and they both worked. Some of the higher, you know, something, a key switch that was in a few hundred K of resistance, it might take four days soaking in regular laundry ammonia for it to bring it down, and then it was kind of saturated with water. 
So after rinsing it, I would have to soak it in alcohol to, to draw out the, the water, which sped up the, you know, the drying process, and then it worked fine. A friend of mine in Germany said, hey, I tried some dilute lye, maybe like a teaspoon of lye and a few hundred milliliters of water. That works much faster. I like that idea a lot better. And uh, I've not met a key switch yet. I can't rejuvenate that way. I just did an Epson HX20 LCD that looked very, very terrible, and it took about five hours in the lye solution, and then I let it, after rinsing it, let it soak overnight in alcohol. And even the next, after all that soaking, the next morning, there was like a, an oily film on top of the, the alcohol. And that got that LCD fixed up. So it, it's very simple. Uh, there's not much to it, and even, you know, the zebra strips and things like that, that you might not normally be able to save you might be able to do that. If the zebra strip's been contaminated by leaking batteries, probably not. That usually does them in, which is usually what happens with these Model 100 type. Um, these little rubber keypads like this, the some remotes and everything, that just has a conductor rubber painted on the surface, which normally wears off because they're made to be cheap. There's lots of stuff you can buy on Amazon and other places to recoat these. Most of them don't work. This was the best kit I found that actually worked. They quit making it, of course, because you know it was effective. Um, and then I realized that what's in this kit? Well, there's super glue. There's a super glue activator, which just means alcohol or something to clean the rubber really good, and a graphite paint pen. So what you do is you clean the rubber really well you brush on a little bit of super glue to the pads. The super glue sticks to the pads. When the super glue is dry, you put your conductive paint over the super glue. The paint sticks to the super glue. So the paint wouldn't stick really well to the rubber by itself. We're using that super glue as an interface. This works great. I had a friend that had some type of little Korg music thing about Bob. I'm not a music person, but I redid the whole keypad on that thing with him for like three or four years ago, it's still working fine. This is off a MakerBot printer, which I did like about that long ago. It's still working fine too. Um, as we shift into more mechanical repairs, I want to start with something easy. And it took me so long to think of this idea, it's embarrassing, but a lot of rubber feet on our equipment are just disc of rubber. Right? And you're always like, where do I find a, a four millimeter disc of rubber that's one and a half millimeters thick? And it finally occurred to me, you can buy a hollow punch set, fairly a good quality one, fairly inexpensively. You can buy little pieces of rubber, you know, like neoprene rubber in various thicknesses, you know, a millimeter and a half, two millimeters thick. And you could make your own little rubber feet on demand, whatever size you want when you need them. So, uh, this works great, especially for the small portable stuff I like. This falls in those sizes of rubber feet. You stick them on with um, some double-sided tape, which I'll show in a bit. Works great. And it's so simple, it's like escaped me for years. Okay, physical repair of plastics. If I say plastic, everybody knows what I mean, but it's a broad category. It's like saying cake, right? If I say cake, you guys know what I mean. But angel food cake is different from devil's food cake, right? Is it chocolate cake or yellow cake? They're like different, different consistency, slightly different ingredients, and they all have different properties. Plastic is like that times 10. Uh, they have different properties. They're used for different things. They have different failure types, and they have different repair techniques. Some types of plastics are impossible or next to impossible to glue, like nylon and delrin and things in that category. Forget about gluing them. Uh, there are some types of super glue that will stick okay to nylon unless the nylon flexes and then and because the glue is not going to flex. Uh, it didn't advance. Okay, gluing plastic. We're going to divide glues, which is another broad category, into two main categories. We have solvent type glues, which melts the base plastic and the melted bits mixed together. Um, and the solvent evaporates and we have kind of 
the original base plastic in a mixture of the base plastic. Uh, this is similar to a, a welding process, right? Where you're melting the parent material, adding some filler material. Um, epoxies, super glues, structural adhesives, those are mechanical bonding. They're sticking to the surface imperfections in whatever you're gluing. It's like tape, but in a liquid form. Um, so depending on what we're going to glue, this might dictate the properties of these types of glue might dictate which we would want to choose. What we need to glue might come in different shapes. Cracked screw post. This is oh so common on keyboards and things like that. Chunks busted out of cases. This is another common thing. This poor case right here. Somebody had packaged a 1541 disk drive on top of this Commodore 64 case, you know, which the disk drive weighs like 10 pounds. And you know, for 500 miles, it's bouncing like that and just smashed it to smithereens. Uh, these screw posts are like this on everything. It seems especially keyboards have this problem. So as long as we're talking about screws, uh, I wanted to make the point that screws for plastic are not the same thing as sheet metal screws. They have different properties. And sheet metal screws, if you try to use them, will sometimes work and sometimes just bust out the plastic that you're trying to screw into. Uh, most plastic screws you'll probably come across are these thread cutting type. They have a blunt tip with that little notch in them, and that's what cuts the threads when you screw them in there. Uh, there are also thread forming plastic screws, which have a, kind of a funny appearance. Uh, you notice on the, in the next slide when we compare this to a, a sheet metal screw that these plastic screws for plastic have coarser threads and a uh, shallower root. So we have a sheet metal screw over here which is pointy. Uh, it's got uh, many more threads. They're deeper. This is a screw for plastic, which is also pointy. Sometimes if something is hard to assemble and to get the holes aligned, they might use a screw like this because the point helps in alignment. But notice it is not the same as the sheet metal screw. And they generally design screws for plastic to avoid breaking out things like screw posts. And that's why if you put a sheet metal screw in there, you, you have a bad day. Uh, one top tip, when you're installing a screw back into a, a hole that already has threads in it, Rotate the screw, put slight pressure on it, rotate it counterclockwise. You'll hear and or feel a slight click. That's the screw dropping into the threads that are already there. Then start turning clockwise. That avoids cutting new threads into that, that plastic screw hole and you won't strip it out that way. Uh, repairing screw post like this. Uh, here I've got a, a piece of ABS that was machined to make a castellated sleeve that goes over right here. And the, the, the slots are cut in here to, to fit over the slots on this post. Uh, the, years ago, I started making things like this at, from the suggestion of a friend and I used the brass and aluminum tubing you can find at hobby shops. So the important thing is the the ID of the tube matches the OD of your post. If you've got ribs on there like that, you can cut slots in the tubing, whether it be metal or plastic, with like a fret saw, something like that. Uh, for this application, there are so many of these broken. I make kits for these that I just machine them out. Uh, for other things where I haven't needed so many or it's a really funny shape, I've 3D printed some parts like that. This is, again, in that really busted case. Um, this is the PCB mount for the bottom of the case. And we have this narrow diameter up here, which is what the originals were. It fits up through some holes in a metal cover on the bottom of the board. I made the base larger, though, so there's a lot of surface area for gluing. Now, when gluing things like this, generally this case plastic is going to be some variation of ABS, but it could be different things. Um, when you're gluing like plastic to like plastic uh, with a plastic that will uh, glue with a solvent glue like ABS or uh, PCV, you can use a solvent glue, you know, like a plumber's glue. 
which is basically what that is. It's a, it's a, a solvent with a, a little thickener in it. I tested some of that with these uh, ABS uh, PCB mounts right there uh, and compared that to a uh, uh, urethane type epoxy and they worked equally well. The urethane epoxy will also work with mixed types of plastic and plastic to metal and things like that. So that's generally uh, what I use. Uh, this is this type of application you wouldn't want to use super glue or, or something like that. Generally you've got more spacing between things, right? Super glue is not good unless you have a real <coughs> tight fit. So, um, oh, I meant to mention a couple types of epoxy that's really good for this type of work. One is DEVCON 22045 Plastic Welder or JB Weld 50133. I mentioned these specifically because I've tested both. They both work really well. The DEVCON is a little better. I like it better. It smells horrible. Once you open it, it doesn't last very long. The JB Weld for this application works just as well. Um, and it lasts a lot longer once you open it. So that's usually what I buy. And it seems in some places in the world, the JB Weld seems to be easier to get than the DEVCON. Other crazy ways to repair things. When you have a big flat surface that has all these cracks in it, these were solvent welded with acetone. And if you've ever used, um, I used acetone in a, a syringe with a, you know, a, a blunt needle and you can drip it into the crack from the backhand side, but it can cause something called blooming on the other side where some of the acetone leaks out and it'll change the color of plastic on the outside, which is the important side. So you gotta be careful of that. There's no really good way to do it. Uh, this case was really busted up anyhow. So a functional case was better than no case. Over these really cracked areas, I used some of that uh, urethane epoxy and glued down mending plates. This one is gonna go over here. And uh, that did a really good job. This case is still usable now, you know, about three years later. I tried another technique uh, on some cracks that were over here, or I took a piece of copper wire that I bent into a zigzag. I would have rather used stainless steel, but I didn't have any. And I wanted to use some type of metal that would not uh, corrode. So uh, then I used a big blunt tip on a soldering iron and melted that into the, the, across the, the crack to form a stitch. Now they actually make tools for this uh, that have stainless steel staples that look like a zigzag and basically a soldering gun that heats it up and you heat it up and you push it on the crack and it does the same job. I didn't have that tool at that time. I bought the tool after that thinking I would use it all the time. I've used it on my truck bed liner and haven't needed it since. But this works as good. This, don't use a brand new soldering iron tip to do this because it'll ruin the soldering iron tip. But it is a viable method for uh, repair. Case clips. You know, we have two-piece cases and sometimes you'll have screws on one side and clips that go like this on the other. They break off like this. Um, so for this one, I designed these replacement clips so you could cut off the old piece flush with the case. And it uses that as kind of a, a, a reference or registration point to align the new clip. And the new clips are much longer on the back here. So you have a really good surface area for gluing. And with repairs like this, you've got to watch your clearances. And when I was testing these out, I used some E6000 glue, which sticks really well. It's kind of permanently temporary. You can, <coughs> with some effort, get it to separate and clean it off. And you know that allowed me to try various designs and get what worked without permanently gluing something to the case. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention on this. These clips right here are actually printed on a 3D printer laying on their side. Uh, the weakest part in a, a 3D print like this on an FDM printer is the interface between successive layers. Uh, so by printing them on the side, all the, the layer lines are like this and most of the stress is along this axis, so we're pulling on the strongest part of the 3D print. We're not tending to separate the layers. Here is another repair technique. I bought this 
It's a mini set nine a year or two ago here at Handy Assembly. It looked really good. I didn't realize until I went to put it back together that at some point in its previous life it had been dropped, but it must have been dropped flat because there's no indication on the exterior of the case. But the spindle motor being the heaviest part inside shattered its mount. And uh, I wasn't sure what to do at the start. So I, I found all the bits and crumbly pieces that I could inside the case that were still there. I used acetone to solvent glue those. Uh, you can see there's still lots of chunks missing. And you might get a hint here and here that I'm doing something else. Here I'm using super glue and baking soda to fill in and build up all the areas that aren't there. I said before that super glue was a mechanical type bond. Well, in this case, it actually has a chemical reaction with the baking soda, which you can tell because it gets warm. It's an exothermic reaction. Uh, I've got a blunt syringe needle in the screw hole here. I wrapped it with some cat temp tape so I wasn't completely plugging the hole. It would, that way, after I was done, the hole would still be in the same place. I didn't have to guess where it was and try to drill it out. But you put down a little bit of baking soda you drip some super glue on it, the super glue will seep in and you keep doing that until you build the area up. Um, using files and a dremel tool, carved it back down to the original shape and it was perfectly functional and looked really, really ugly. It looked like super glue and baking soda. So I took a black Sharpie marker and colored it over, which you'll never see from the outside of the unit, but at least I know it looks kind of more normal on the inside. And this is, it's ugly, right? But it's a perfectly functional repair. Yeah? Why not um, epoxy? I would have tried epoxy, but what, what made you not go epoxy? Uh, the, well, I wanted to try this technique to start with, and it's very formable, and it makes a very uh, strong and machinable bend. I was able to take a, a, a thread-cutting plastic screw and cut threads in the original hole. You've seen this um, a lot of... Uh, Guys that make guitars, what are they called? Luthiers. Yes, luthiers. Uh, they'll use this when they have a, a, a loose fret slot so they can slightly build that up. So, um, it also, super glue CA will wick into smaller spaces, whereas epoxy you would have to try to force into the smaller spaces. Yep. Yeah, I was really surprised what a good job that this technique does. And it takes the minimum amount of tools to make work. You know, super glue and baking soda and a dermal tool or some files. That's it. Um, physical repairs of metal. This is where you get into some more expensive tools. Um, something to keep in mind is that tin, brass, and copper can be soldered to. And you can get brass and copper and a lot of structural shapes from hobby shops and things like that which can be used to make or remake parts that have been damaged and you can solder them together if it needs more strength you can use a silver solder it's a good inexpensive way to make some repairs and <coughs> structural adhesives in the the urethane um, type of epoxy will stick well to metal and bond it to plastic and things actually the um The Lotus Elise has the aluminum channel frame and they actually glued that together. Right, that they tried welding and all sorts of thing and they wound up using a couple a rivet at each end and glue in between because that was the strongest. And the rivets just stop it from wanting to zipper open if it gets impacted. Um, we've seen this plate before. The plate looked great. The rest of the printer was not so lucky. This is a 3M really thin double-sided tape. When you've got a plastic or a, a metal fascia on something, they always tend to peel up in the corners. And it's like, can I get some glue under there? What can I do? Glue has never worked out well for me. This stuff has the consistency of the type of double-sided adhesive they use on rubber feet and these types of panels originally from the factory. It's great stuff. You can get it anywhere. This probably came from Walmart cut a little piece, stuck it under the corner of this that was loose, pushed it down, cut off the excess with a knife. Good repair. Very, very easy to do. 
more extensive metal repairs. This is a micro cassette deck which was used on 10,000 different models of answering machines back in the 90s. Um, it was also used in some various computers uh, for data storage. Uh, this is out of a, a convergent work slate which is the strangest little portable computer ever conceived, especially because it was made by a company that made many computers. Totally did not fit into their product line. It's no wonder if it was a flop. Uh, it's only differentiated that it has a stereo head on it, rather than a mono head. It actually had two data tracks for each side of the tape. Very odd. Anyhow, this is the pinch roller arm. Right here we see the circle. There's supposed to be a little nub there. That nub sheared off. Somebody got the tape stuck in there and used a crowbar or something, you know, brute force to try to get it out. Uh, this was an attempt at an extreme repair. This is what's called a blank arbor. It's basically just a round piece of metal that screws onto the nose of a micro uh, lathe, a tabletop lathe, screws onto the chuck. I drilled and tapped it to accept a 256 screw which you can see sticking out over here and screwed the screw in there and then cut down the sides of the screw to the diameter of that nub. So I've got, you know, six or eight threads sticking in this armor, arbor, the size of the shaft I want and a screw head up here. What size is that? Like what's that diameter? It looks pretty damn small. Um, 256, about two millimeters in diameter. So then here's our arm. We drill and tap a hole in the arm. And the, the screw that was machined down is all in one piece. Started in there with some thread locker, cut off with a Dremel tool, and then you know, the burrs filed off of it. And then you have a little nub again. This is actually my second attempt. This is actually a 440 screw because the, my first threading into this arm didn't work well. It's pot metal. It wasn't very strong. So I had to redo the whole thing. But that worked. The rest of the cassette deck was fixed on this particular machine. The rest of the machine was another story. Uh, there's no schematics or anything for it. And each one I've taken apart has about 50 or 60 bodge wires and they're all different board revisions and there's bodge wires loose and you don't, it's, it's insane. It was the type of thing, as they were going out of business, they like made them work and sold them on QVC to, to get rid of them, right? Um, something else. This is the ALPS printer plotter mechanism, which was used in CGP 115, the PC2 printer cassette interface, and about two dozen other printers from the 1980s, and a lot of medical equipment and things like that. Brilliant little mechanism. I love these things. Some people hate them because they're slow. They fascinate me. It's a great example of minimalist design that accomplishes a lot. And we think about for the cost of these things, you get a four color printer plotter, right? at a normal person's budget in the 1980s. Uh, this gear here originally was plastic. Uh, that is a 0.25 modulus gear and there's 17 teeth or 13 teeth or something. It's a very small gear. I've got some over here. Um, anytime you have a plastic gear pressed onto a metal shaft, after 20 years, that gear will probably crack because the plastic always shrinks. The metal doesn't shrink, so something's got to give. It's the plastic. Every one of these, that gear is broken on. I have yet to see one that has an intact gear. Uh, some people have tried gluing them. Nylon doesn't glue, as, as we talked about. Uh, some people have tried 3D printing them with mixed results. Getting the inner diameter right on something as small 3D printing it is a chore. Uh, it's a tough thing to do. After a couple years of searching, I found a manufacturer that could make these in reasonable quantities out of brass. If you try to, uh, if you were to injection mold these, each gear would cost about a tenth of a cent, but it would cost ten thousand dollars to make the mold. So, and you have a minimum order on an injection parts like that, about ten thousand. So, yeah, there's no way that would ever pay for itself. But these were reasonable. This is something I can't do myself, but there are services now like. Uh, PCBWay was mentioned earlier. They do custom CNC machining, sheet metal work, and um, 3D printing. 
things like that. There's lots of different services you can find out. There's Shapeways here in the US, which has all sorts of 3D printing services. So even if it's something you can't make yourself at home, you can probably find a service online that can do it for you. It takes a little while to figure out what can be made and how you might need to design it. But it's possible now. And speaking of 3D printing, um, for our hobby here of restoring vintage computers, we can use this for all sorts of things, from repair parts to parts for new stuff. Um, we saw the cab, the ta repair tabs, other mechanical parts, cases for new things that we made, new accessories. Um, there are two main types of 3D printers that will come into contact with this hobbyist. One is fused deposition modeling. This is the one we're most familiar with. There are rolls of plastic. You know, it's like a, a plastic string. It's melted and squirted out, and you build up layers of stuff, and you wind up with a part. Those work great. They're very easy to use, very hobbyist friendly. Uh, that's what these things were printed on, and these were printed on a not so great uh, FDM printer. These parts were printed on a better FDM printer. This is uh, an SD card drive that's a replacement for the Tandy portable disk drive one and two. So the case was printed on there. This is a 16K RAM expansion. The original RAM expansion for this machine was about this big. And the case is big, you know, three times the size of the board that's inside it here. So you there are lots of design tools within the range of the uh, hobbyists now that lets you do this type of stuff. Resin printing lets you make things of such a resolution and quality, it is mind-blowing. These gears I printed on a $300 resin printer. This is the first project I've ever tried on a resin printer. So I started from having next to no knowledge. Uh, when you, 3D printing, uh, the difference between a resin printer and a, uh, an FDM printer, the melting plastic type printer, the only thing they have in common is the name. Every other part of the process is completely different. A resin printer, you pour a goo in a tank and the goo is a ultraviolet hardening resin. It's like epoxy that hardens with ultraviolet light. Uh, it can be exposed with a, a laser. Uh, the new ones, the low cost ones for hobbyists, they use an LCD screen that has an ultraviolet backlight. So it uses the LCD to block off what should be exposed and it builds this up in 50 micron layers. To give you an idea of the scale of this gear, this is the original gear in place on the Alps printer plotter mechanism. This is the, the y-axis, the paper feed. I, I think this is off the CGP 115 which I have here and I patched it by taking a three millimeter hose clamp and cutting the ears off of it and convincing it to go on that cracked plastic hub, which puts enough pressure on it, it allows it to drive it. It's a good patch. Uh, these gears are about 12 millimeters in diameter. There's 27 teeth. And this text is one millimeter tall and a tenth of a millimeter deep. It won't always resolve. You have to you know, hold your mouth just right and things um, to get that to come out. But it produces reasonable results. Um, the, like I said, the inside hole diameter for something this small is really tough to get. Um, but it's doable. Refinishing. Okay, refinishing vintage equipment of any type can elicit a lot of strong emotions and opinions. All right, I'm not here to convince you you ought to or you ought not to. Uh, I got started thinking about this by when I, well, I'll get into that, but I just wanted to see what the facts were in certain situations, not what all the, the rumors were floating around. So my point is, it's your gear, it's your choice. I have some things I have restored, and I have some things I've left with stickers and everything on it because it was part of the history of the device. So I don't think there's one answer that is all encompassing. Uh, the easiest thing to get into when, when plastic polishing will kind of ease into the subject uh, or the, with refinishing is plastic polishing. Uh, you know, so we'll kind of ease into the subject. And we get into this with trying to polish scratches out of clear plastics. 
it also works on opaque plastics. This is another thing that was so readily apparent it took me years to figure it out. And we can remove scratches and restore luster to plastic parts. So a Tandy pocket computer, scratch bezel that can't be removed because it's glued in forever and ever. Uh, my favorite plastic polish is this Novus. There is a one, two, and three. One is like a fine, the final cleaner polish. It goes three as a coarse, two is fine. Mask off the area where you don't want the polish to go. Very important. Use a soft rag. These are like t-shirt material or microfiber cloth. And you know, it's kind of like the um, Karate Kid, wax on, wax off, that type of thing. It works wonders. Uh, my favorite top coat after polishing something like this is either the Nose, Novus Number no. 1 or Brilliant Ice. I've used Brilliant Ice for 30 years. Great stuff. It leaves a slightly slick, uh, almost static dissipative coating, which is amazing because I just looked up the MSDS sheet on this. It's 98% water. And the 2% the is magic secret ingredients they don't disclose. So whatever it is, it's good stuff. Opaque plastics. This is a keyboard. Uh, we'll see the rest of this computer in just a few minutes. That the sides of the keys that were facing the sun faded really bad. Uh, on these darker keys, retro brighting doesn't work out most of the time. It does funny things with darker colors and you never know what it'll do. So I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I didn't want to try retro bright again because that wasn't going to work out. Missed a click in there. And then it occurred to me that since these keys were a double shot plastic, the, the white lettering on the top was a separate color of plastic injection from the brown that I might be able to polish them since most of the polishing was on the brown side anyhow. So I started out with this uh, headlight restoration kit, which I had for the, you know, to remove the, the yellow and scratches from the front of plastic headlight covers. Uh, it comes with these little sanding pads. You buff up the plastic and then I tried the polishing compound that comes with this and I went back to the, the Novus. Uh, here I have a Dremel tool arbor with the polishing pads stacked up in there. Do not use the Dremel tool. It will melt the plastic. Don't ask me how I know. No matter what speed you set the Dremel tool, it's too fast. Uh, so I'm just using a battery power drill here. Perfect speed. Um, and the same thing. You just start like you're polishing the clear plastic. And you go over that. And you wind up with the original key. You can see how it's the dark brown here and a light brown here to a polish key that looks like original. Depending on how the top is, sometimes you might need to blend it in a little there. Works great on things that you otherwise couldn't do anything with. And these keys, you know, the, the plastic is like a millimeter thick in that color. So the, you know, the few microns you're polishing off the edge isn't going to make any difference in our lifetimes or our great grandkids' lifetimes. And then for things like this in cases, I'll go over it then with this uh, 303 protectant. Uh, my truck bed cover manufacturer recommended this stuff, which is why I bought it originally. It's fantastic. I'll like coat the keys in that and let it soak in. And of course, it doesn't really soak into the plastic. It just wets out everywhere. Wipe it off. Usually let it set overnight. Wipe it off again. It keeps them looking great for a long time. OK, Retrobrite. Now, I have to admit, the first time I heard about this, I thought this was the stupidest idea in the world. <coughs> Why would somebody be dumb enough to use UV light to get rid of the yellowing on the plastic when everybody knows UV light is what colors, you know, causes the yellowing on the plastic, right? It did not make any sense. And things like that bother me. I want to know why. I want to know how it works. I'm not satisfied with, with the myths. So I looked into this for months. I read all sorts of papers. One of the advantages of working for a university is you can get research papers from everything for free, right? You can spend your whole life looking up research papers. Um, and I, I did a big long video on this and the idea was to try to use a scientific method or things you could do at home with the equipment you could have at home, not stuff you'd find in, in a university laboratory, right? but still using a scientific method. 
So before talking about yellowing and what causes it, I want to briefly touch on what light is, refresh everybody's memory. Uh, the white light we see from our lights in here in this room is made up of several different wavelengths or colors. When the light strikes something, some of that those wavelengths are uh, absorbed, some reflect off, we see the reflected wavelengths. Thus, my blue jeans are blue because they're reflecting mostly blue light. Okay, what is this thing? Well, this image I got from uh, Wikipedia. It is a red blood cell, and uh, part of the features here around the edges are the chromophores, which is what gives it its color. Uh, the, the atomic bonds, the shapes of the molecules, or the shape of the, the bonds between the atoms, the, the shape the molecule makes up, is what determines what color is reflected. So when something yellows, these bonds are altered and it shifts it to reflecting more yellow light. When we retrobrite, we're shifting it back to reflecting more blue light. And this yellowing process is interesting. This is a famous picture from the web. Uh, the Nintendo on the far left there was still owned by the same guy that originally bought it. It's been in, exposed to the same amount of sunlight its whole life for decades. And the plastic yellowed at a very different rate. So, you know, when we talked before about plastics being different, even the same type of plastic, a slightly different mixture with slightly different ingredients will respond to uh, the processes that cause yellowing differently. And it can respond to the processes that try to de-yellow it much differently. Uh, the thing to remember here is that what causes this yellowing is a natural chemical reaction that is always happening. Um, well, unless you get it down to like absolute zero, it's always going to yellow. Um, there's things we can do to speed it up. There's things we can do to slow it down, but it's always going to happen. The thing we can do to speed the reaction up is to, well, as with any chemical reaction, is to add energy, right? So you can add energy in the form of heat or light, um, which is where the UV from the sun comes in. Uh, this closed tube on the, the side here, that contains a chemical called bromine, which is used in uh, many fire retardants in plastics. Years ago, somebody got the idea that because bromine is kind of this yellow-orange color and it's used in fire retardants and plastic, it must be cause, causing the plastic to turn yellow when the bromine leaches out of the plastic. Uh, the biggest problem with this theory is that bromine evaporates at like minus 40 degrees, which happens to be the same temperature in either Fahrenheit or Celsius. So uh, whatever is your favorite measurement system, unless you're like in the Arctic Circle with your plastic, you know, if we're anywhere to leach out of the plastic, it's going to evaporate immediately. It's not going to affect the color at all. What is true, or what has been found to be true, is that some fire retardants containing bromine can accelerate the yellowing process. Other fire retardants with bromine do not. So it's a combination of the chemicals in that fire retardant. Um, we're going to be looking at this case in more detail. This is the most yellowed case I have ever seen. Okay, I'll speed it up. It's a VIC-20, it looked like cheddar cheese. So I wanted to see if retrobriting for a long time would really turn it to mush. I have a tank here with about a 6% solution of hydrogen peroxide. The bottles are just filled with water taking up space. Tank lined with seedling heat mats to about 40 or 50 degrees C. Uh, you can also use ultraviolet light for this, but light is directional, warm liquid is not. So, day, the original day, after one day, after two days, three days, four days, five days, six days, and seven days, it did not turn to mush. This is seven days and 6% uh, hydrogen peroxide um, at 40 to 50 degrees C. The only place on the case that got worse was these cracks which already existed in the vents up here which is the heat vents, which are on every VIC-20. So perhaps if I had, had, had glued those before I retrobited it, it would have prevented them from getting worse. And then it was treated with 303 protectant. 
Um, painting, I use painting very sparingly. I use it to retroflush things like making this gray GoTech and the white adapter look the same as the rest of my Model 4P. If you have paint on plastic, like, I don't know, this Model 4 over here that you don't want on there, DOT 3 brake fluid is safe on most plastics and it will eat paint off so you can put it on a rag, put your rag on your paint and let it soak and the paint will fall off. Okay, I'm not sure how much time we have left for questions, but five minutes, okay. Yeah, with the retrograding, have you done any experiments on whether uh, yellowing comes back worse after you've done it? I've heard that. Um, it can. There was a uh, researcher who did that and found out that even plastic that is kept in the dark from new will yellow. Bringing it into the light will might reverse that a little bit. Um, some people that have retrobited something have noticed the same thing, I think, and it's just from intuition that uh, coating it in that through through protectant helps remove some of the oxygen from the surface. It's at least going to slow that process down. Uh, I assume since it is a natural occurring chemical reaction that no matter what you do, it's going to get yellower. But at least in my lifetime, it's going to look nicer. There was a museum in Sweden which did some microphotography on lots of different types of plastic and said, I don't know, maybe it causes some micro cracks or something in the surface of the plastic. I'm, I'm guessing just by this VIC-20 case that they were there to begin with, they just couldn't see them very well. And I'm not a museum. I don't wear gloves touching my equipment and I actually use them. So I'm not worried about what it's like in 300 years. The advice I give owners I've got a couple model ones that I think have been owned by chain smoking farm animals and no matter how much I've cleaned it when you power it on the electronics get warm again everything just comes yeah. right back. Yeah, yeah. If you've got stuff that's like trapped in dust and everything, and the in power supplies on the board, that's tough. Um, I uh, I really don't know. There may be something like what's the the Febreze type thing, because that tends to neutralize odor more than than covering it up. Yeah, ozone, Mike. Uh, ozone can be tough on plastic. So. Febreze air. Yes, I'm all too familiar with chain smokers and electronics. What about edge card connectors, vitalizing those? Um, I like to clean those lightly with the eraser from a number two pencil. That'll get rid of most of the gunk. Um, nothing really abrasive like sandpaper or the fiberglass pen or anything like that. If it's like one of the really cheap cards that has uh, solder instead of gold, then you can be a little more brutal with those because you can recode them with solder. But the gold contacts is basically clean it with the pencil. I'll you know do a few contacts and I'll rub the pencil eraser on my jeans and, and keep going. And deoxit makes a special formula just for gold. So that would be the stuff to use on gold. And sometimes with with card edge contacts, you have to insert it several times with the connector. Sometimes I've taken some deoxit and squirted on a piece of thin cardboard that's the same thickness as the board and uh, you know saturated the cardboard with it and then inserted that several times to clean the contacts. I got a little here a little bit late, but uh, I had really good luck with uh, ultrasonic cleaners for like keys. It just gets all that uh, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the, um, the only caution I give with ultrasonic cleaners were for circuit boards with parts that would leak or 30 kilohertz crystals. And um, again, test, like every other type of cleaning solution, test it on something small before you go uh, full scale. Okay. Yeah, that I I, sh I showed that on the screen there briefly. It is a you can get it like a hair style supply places. It's uh, they call it a developer. They use when bleaching hair. 
The, the volume 40 is 20% hydrogen peroxide, and then I dilute that down with distilled water. You, wanna, you don't want to use tap water. You don't know what's in it or how it's going to react, so, or what stains that might cause on your equipment. You can also use, um, oh, I cannot think of it. It's a, it's a dry chemical that when you add water, it, uh, what's that? OxyClean? Um, no, OxyClean contains it. It's, it's one of the active ingredients in OxyClean. Perchloric. Uh, per, perchloric acid. No, anyhow, so, so, sodium carbonate. Okay, anyhow, uh, when you add water, it precipitates soda ash and uh, releases uh, hydrogen peroxide. That works, it's a little cloudy and it is uh, mildly caustic, so any metal that's in the plastic will corrode. No, I, I prefer uh, an immersion method in liquid. It gets rid of all those problems with cellophane. It's much more controllable. Okay, thank you.